session of Irish History from the Hedgerow at the Irish Roots Cafe, produced by irishroots.com, with Peter Riley Adams and Michael O'Laughlin. Find a spot on the warm, sunny side of the Hedgerow now. Today's session is about to begin. They were rough, unpolished men, brilliant scholars, teaching by the side of the road, in small rooms, in nooks and crannies, wherever and whenever possible. Such men as these, they were the teachers of the hedge. When I was a gossoon of eight years or so, with me turf and me primer, to school, oh, to school I did go. Hi, lee, lee, lum, dee, day, day. I went to a schoolhouse without any floor. Hi, lee, lee, lay, dee, lum, day. Songs emerged out of it. You, it it's, and the story's being told. You know, the, I, I took my turf. You know, well, that schoolmaster, you know, he was just drunk. The song goes on basically to say that after a while, I became better at drinking than the schoolmaster, Well, the, and we, which is what they said was happening. You that's know? right. And we have to realize, too, that, uh, you know, looking back like this, we get a little romantic about what the head school was. But in reality, it would have been a little damp. And maybe some days you didn't want to go to school. And maybe you got, you know, these were itinerant teachers sometimes that went from place to place. And, and uh, they relied on the payment from the parents uh, really to uh, support themselves. And they said, you know, sometimes it was my shame that I taught for six, six pence a quarter. And some of the courses, um, it would be a different charge for the different course. That's right. So, you know, one could be a penny, uh, one could be two pennies, but sometimes they pay them in butter. Or they, you know, they paid them in eggs. They had to, you know, you have to feel about the time. Uh, where'd you get this money that you just come in and where are you going to buy it? How big was the market? You're not, you don't live here. And also some of the, um, some of the, the parents would let the, the hedge master stay in their home. He might stay in the barn, he might stay in the shack in the back, but they gave him a place to stay while he was helping the children, their children or other children in the area, uh, get their education. Well, you know, I've just got a few more things to say on this, uh, the 17th century. Uh, you know, Kilkenny plays a really an important role in the 17th century. We talk about that some in our uh, uh, other podcast on, on what was going on in Ireland. There's also going to be a resurgence of Catholic schools with the coming of, of James II, but that was lost pretty quick as he fell and his attempt to uh, uh, really loosen things up for the Catholics didn't really work. But, you know, there was a uh, a time there when the English were trying all kinds of things, putting up free schools, any kind of school they could, could get the Irish to come, and mainly it was so they would put aside the Irish language, the Irish ways, and learn the true way and the true faith, really. It was a religious thing, too, they tried to move them. And wasn't there, uh, 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 there used to be great debates, you know, when these itinerant teachers came from village to village, uh, town to town, that no, there wasn't an established school, so you had to just vie for the attention and the monies of the parents. And sometimes there was competition between two teachers, and they say if he, one teacher could make up a good verse, that it would uh, put down the other teacher, and the other teacher would have to leave because he had been so badly beaten by a little bit of poetry written by uh, uh, one teacher. And I think there was an instance of that. Peter, how did that little uh, little four liner go? Oh, it was lovely, too. But as a precursor to that, the Kilkenny Bible School or Bible Society used to give out uh, Bibles and used to uh, try to control things. So if you were in that, you were obviously on the Protestant side, or you're, and they would maybe give you a little something. So one of the headmasters, uh, in attempting to uh, overrun the other one, said, In teaching the young our mother tongue, at least I may venture to mention, I'm better than some who greedily thumb the Bible Society pension. Oh, and that run the other guy out of town, didn't it? Out he was, because it also showed your loyalties. And can we trust you? That's right. There's something wrong there. He's taken a few pennies from these people who are, you know, supposed to be our friends, but we know what they're after. So uh, uh, that's another one of those hidden little uh, hidden agendas. agendas. Hidden yes, agenda. yes, quite true. 
And, you know, they're uh, talking about those different store uh, school systems that were set up. There were uh, around 1730, there were charter schools that were set up. There was 58 of them, and they were set up by the establishment. And uh, they were really built to win over the Catholics to Protestantism. And uh, they found there was uh, several of abuses uh, involved. Sometimes the teachers were given the funds for all the students and to feed and clothe them throughout the year. But inspectors would come by and the children were neglected, sitting on top of tables with no shoes on and and barely eaten. They looked like they were starving. It wasn't going the way that the uh, people at the top of the administration had figured. No, uh, and what's going on is that, you know, you're not really satisfying the need of the people. So even though uh, we're trying to show that, and even if the the English were, and some of them were, legitimately trying to make things better, and if that didn't happen and the headmaster or the teacher and whatever was taking the money for themselves, you weren't solving the problem that the English were sending the money in an attempt to solve. It was mainly, mainly continuing the problem, if not making it worse. You know, I also read, we talked about how in the old days, the great families, uh, the gentry of Ireland would contribute money and they would endow a school so the school students might be able to go there for free if they were particularly talented. Well, uh, the authorities had enough of that, and in 1782, they actually had an act that said it was illegal for uh, endowing a Catholic school, and that uh, just kept a free school from existing for the Irish for any purposes whatsoever, and that's why these head schools were also called pay schools, uh, though be it the pay would be mighty meager most of the time. Uh, and there was also uh, the Baptist Society. They had uh, schools, and uh, most of those schools, there were 88 of them, and they were in the province of Connaught, and uh, they used the Irish language to convert the Irish to Protestantism. And uh, that, was a very, that was a very unique thing because most of the other times it was strike out that Irish language, but when they saw they weren't going to beat it, they actually said, well, let's use it uh, to convert them. It's like using your own weapon to get you, you know, it's, uh, and uh, it didn't work, <laughs> but uh, uh, the Irish did see through it and realize, and, but they, the Irish are very good at playing along with you. They would let you, uh, let you do what you wanted and then go and do their own thing in, on the side. They would listen to you, take what you could to give them at the moment because of the situation, but then go right among, about their own business. And, you know, as we move into, of course, things are really changing rapidly in Ireland now, even though it might not have seen that way if you had lived at that time. In 1811, the Kildare Place Society, they actually granted money to schools uh, if the books were restricted to a certain kind and the Bible was read without commentary. Uh, They supplied trainings and books and inspections and plans And uh, in the beginning, the Irish liked that idea because they weren't really going to force anything. But as always, uh, some politicians got in there and twisted it back to the old way. And uh, you saw Irish support uh, really falling out for it. And it just didn't quite look uh, quite look look right to them. So they couldn't support it. And if we're coming to the end of really the heyday of the uh, head schools now, we're looking around 1824. They did a count and uh, they had about. 1,700 schools, they were helping out of a total of 11,800 in Ireland. And at that time, there were 9,000 pay schools that got no assistance whatsoever. So you see how uh, strong this urge for uh, educating themselves in their own way was with the Irish. And remember, at the, at the beginning of the 19th century in the 1800s, the early 1800s, uh, Dan O'Connell was making amazing strides. And after the days of George III, uh, Catholicism was then actually permitted to openly practice. And in Ireland, you'll start seeing that there's the building of churches. Uh, There was then the the building then of Catholic education. They were then again permitted to do it in the open. There was still persecution and oppression, but they were let to do it because the, the English decided, we just can't fight this anymore. That's right. And let's look at a few little uh, quotations here. Uh, uh, Pat Frayne, who was a famous uh, fellow involved with the uh, head schools, he had a schoolhouse at Skelgi in County Tyrone. 
And Carlton says as a formal sh- former student that uh, it was just a sod house scooped out of the bank on the roadside. But within a month, l- nearly 100 scholars, mostly male, uh, attended the school. And that was a that was a big size for those head schools. What From what I've read, usually uh, 40 was a decent size. And, of course, it could go down to six or seven. And uh, like we said, most of those schools were closed in the winter. But if they were open during the bad uh, winter time, uh, they brought those uh, one or two sods of turf for that fire. And, you know, we keep looking. And here's another comment from those people that couldn't really understand what was going on. Um, They said, boy, these guys, they cannot pay a tithe or a priest's due, but they gladly pay for little boy's education. And that shows you how the parents really made sacrifices and uh, helped the schoolmaster, even though it wasn't a lot. They didn't have much to give in the first place. Remember, too, that uh, the uh, the money that was being requested from Catholics, from the Irish, was to pay for the Protestant minister, that... was to pay for the Protestant school, was to pay for the Protestant church. It was the salary of the of the Anglican. And but if you're Catholic, you had to pay that too. And they would say, "Oh, I can't pay it. I'm too poor." To, well, no, they they weren't going to do it for a couple of reasons. One, we're not paying for the Anglican minister, and secondly, I do have obligations to my children. Well, if we start look, we well, let's go all the way down to the 1800s again, and we see some things happening here. It's really starting to change. All of a sudden, you're seeing English began to be used in the schools at a, a very much of an increasing rate, even though Irish was still used at home a lot and uh, English was used in the market. And if you went out to make money in the cities and uh, the Irish was sort of fading from view very slowly, not with this generation, but maybe with the next, it'd be gone altogether. And that's why even today we still have areas that are known as the Gaeltic out in the, and it's way out, out in Mayo, out in Connemara, up in Donegal. Uh, There are areas that are somewhat remote and the Irish language is still there. They, on the island I, Isle or the peninsula of Dingle in County Kerry, last year they were arguing about the signs being in Irish or English. Just last year, and this is 2009. So there's still a little bit of a battle, but English is obviously the dominant language. And when you talk about having to use it in the marketplace, well, who were the merchants? You know, yes, the farmers came to sell what little they had in this early part of the century, but the merchants, the gentry, they're the ones, and they were all speaking English. And that, So you needed it in order to survive in a almost a dualistic society. Well, yes, and it was just, uh, gosh, it wasn't 30 days ago I read uh, they were having trouble up north. They were battling over the use of the Irish language for certain uh, purposes, and uh, it's still there. There's still a little battle going on between those two languages. Well, and there is also in our modern time the opening of Gaelic schools where everything is is spoken in Gaelic. And uh, in the last year, there have been some Gaelic schools that have opened in the north of Ireland. Yeah, and who would have thought? Yeah, exactly. So it's still, yeah, the, the discussion and the battle is still there. It's the preservation of the culture which I think so much of this boils down to it. It's the, it's the, the preserving of the who of we are as Irish. Well, and you know, there was a lot of parents that said, hey, you can't have these schools teaching Irish or even the immersion school where everything was in Irish. They said it will affect their other subjects. They won't be able to function in modern society. Well, the last study I saw well, that was earlier in this year actually said that those children who had learned the Irish language were excelling in all of their other studies as well. So maybe it's the matter of when you stimulate the brain and the curiosity, uh, you're able to handle many other matters at the same time. Absolutely. You know, the, the more you have, the more you'll do. And then it, it raises the curiosity. And uh, they were able to, uh, to learn in other subjects. And when they were learning Latin and Greek, in some schools they were even learning Hebrew, well, so they, they were becoming experts in various languages, which made them much more valuable persons. Let's take a look at how these schools were taught. Are some, there are some things in common that uh, actually let us help us describe how they were taught. And this is, of course, uh, what methods they were using of the day. And if you take a look at it, you can see there were several things that distinguished most of these schools. And number one, it was that each child was taught individually. 
it wasn't a group like a group of 10 people for the first grade, a group of 20 people for the second grade. It was each student got individual attention and learned exactly at his own pace, which, of course, we know today that sure helps a lot of people. And number two, they did a lot of reciting from memory uh, where they would sit and recite their songs or the books or their readings or their stories. And uh, I remember one story where it said the schoolmaster, when a stranger was coming by, he made sure all the students got all their books out. And even though they were all in different books, they just all started re- reciting their individual lessons together. So it sounded like a cacophony of sound and learning as the stranger walked by the school. And he might go back and tell some parents, boy, this guy's really good. You ought to send your child to school. Sure. And, you know, when you think of the memorization thing uh, and the poverty that existed, not everybody had all the elements that you might need in order to write down things. So memory became a very important thing. They really were stimulating the mind. Yes, and if you read some of these reports, the few surviving written reports we've got back there, uh, it's like some one fellow said there were uh, 20 people using slates, and I guess it had been slate with chalk, and then 20 kids were using uh, paper, uh, pencil and paper, I guess, pen and paper, quill and paper. And then 20 students, presumably the young ones, were using sand. And that's where they would write their numbers in sand and they could erase it and you wouldn't be using up any uh, valuable assets of the day. And if you were young, that would have been a fun way to learn in the first place. Learning in the sandbox. That's right. (laughs) Think about that, yeah. And they also did a lot of, the third thing I'll say, they did a lot of writing where they would copy headlines that the the, uh, teacher put out to teach them to write. And one thing I saw there was some conversation about, and they were the head school teachers were criticized because they said, well, these people are doing it all wrong. They're teaching children to uh, read before they can write, and they're, teach, you know, they're teaching them how to do all these things out of order. Well, we've learned since. I think there's some uh, theories in education that it's okay to learn several things at the same time. You could learn how to form the letters with your fingers and then learn what the letters meant with your mind on another course, and you actually end up coming out uh, uh, ahead in the end. And there's uh, today in education, and as we've uh, done our uh, research and learning of the head schools for ourselves, in today's education they say, you know, some students learn by listening. Some students learn by reading. Some students learn by seeing and, of course, by hearing. And that, that no st- one student learns the same way, not a group of students. Out of that, each individual student, it takes something else in order for a student to learn. I think the Irish had that down uh, uh, 200 years ago. Take a look at uh, uh, what we're going to have to do here. And if you look in the 1800s, how it's developing – there were also uh, academies that were really head schools that were in the city, even if they were still illegal. They called them academies, and it seems like uh, they were equal to the best of the head schools in the country, and they had a little bit different format uh, since people didn't have to come from uh, miles around to go to school. The time of the school it could start earlier. You could have a longer school day, and it worked much better. And you'll see things, uh, writings about the London Hibernian Society School. And, uh, of course, that wasn't in London. That was These schools were set up in Ireland that we're talking about now. And they started class around 10 o'clock because uh, there were still some people that came from a distance. And they opened with a psalm or a hymn. And uh, then they repeated a task of grammar or spelling. And then, now this was different for the academies and, and the London Hibernian Society. They had lessons in groups which is different from what you normally read about the head school. And uh, they also memorized scripture. And several student monitors were used on help. That seemed to be a big topic, uh, how these uh, advanced students could help monitor and teach the class. Uh, apparently, that might have been revolutionary because in the perhaps earlier times, it was just the teacher and the students better stay in their place. Uh, Peter, you've taught a lot. What do you think? Well, sure, the It is. You you know, there's the old notion of education that the teacher is the only one who can teach and you better sit there and listen. Well, as we've grown in education, we discover that I have to be the facilitator of of learning, but it doesn't necessarily have to be the teacher who is the ultimate answer. Uh, You can have uh, and in graduate schools and things, you also have 
students who have uh, achieved one level, and they're able to then assist the master teacher uh, in carrying out the lessons. And so you either have aides, as we sometimes call them, uh, or just assistants, uh, teaching assistants, and they go in and they help. But then at the end, it is the master teacher who is in charge and who ultimately decides what it is should be taught, needs to be taught, and what has been learned by the individual students. And it does seem that the Irish did have that again, maybe out of necessity. If you look at the uh, uh, role of the head school teacher, he was more than just a teacher of the school. He was often the parish clerk, a duty which he might have performed for free, but it kept him in good stead with the people of the community. And he was also like an old country lawyer. And they said he would draw up wills and presentments and perhaps claims against people. And sometimes he had to draw up his own claim against a parent for not paying him his six shilling for the school year. So that came in handy as well. But it's interesting to note. And oh, and even if you wanted a sweet letter written, a sweet little love letter written, you saw ads in the paper saying, come on down to me, I'll do it for you, and the prices are right. That's right. They're the educated ones. And, the, and you know, uh, in so many uh, across the world, I think, that uh, when we look at the clergy uh, for so long, they were the ones who were the most educated people and that they for then knew. And that's when there did become some rivalry, in a sense, between head schools and the church because the, the pastors who had heretofore been the most educated were running into some of these other men who were extremely well-educated, and they may find themselves disagreeing on various points. Who's going to get what, and who really knows, and who then gets the confidence of the town, the village, or the area? Well, yes, and you know, there's one other thing that I remembered here, and that's, I thought it was rather strange. It said there was a uh, uh, and Elizabeth I sponsored a New Testament translation uh, into Irish for the Irish, for the Bible, which I thought, well, now, why? They're trying to suppress a religion. Why would they actually publish the Bible in the Irish language? Uh, well, it, it's explained in most of the books that I've read that that wasn't really about the Irish. That was about uh, uh, spreading the word of uh, God in the Bible. It was a separate really a separate little container of that day. Uh, it was, you know, James the first, um, when we hear in today's world the King James Bible, and James was the king that came after Elizabeth, was Elizabeth's godson, uh, and James was uh, the son of Mary, Queen of Scots. He is the one that authorized into English, and that's when the of course, into English. We use it in English, and, but that's when it became a very more prolific for the individuals to have, uh, to have the Bible. And if you were able to get them into the faith, I, I know the times we've said that, you know, the popes uh, would try to Christianize, uh, convert to the faith, even the barbarians who were attempting to sack Rome. Well, if you converted them, then maybe they wouldn't be your enemies anymore. And if you're able to make the the Irish, the same religion as you, well, then that could settle down a reason of contention between you. You make that other person a part of you, and therefore uh, then conflict may cease at some level. Well, you know, there was also a lot, of, I'm sure you ran into this, there was a very, there was quite a bit of uh, consternation and uh, uh, really looking down at the Irish when they looked at the books that these children were reading in school. And of course, in the worst of times, you took whatever you found lying on the roadside or something your parents might have read when they were children and they kept held on to that book or anything that was just the cheapest you could find, but it was practice for reading. But you'll see these, the authorities came by and said, well, this is terrible. Look at these books they're reading. Here's some of the titles. Freeney and O'Hanlon, Highwaymen. Another book was Irish Rogues and Rapparees. And another was The Most Celebrated Pirates. And the history of witchcraft and apparitions, and even the new system of boxing. And here's one that ties into the 17th century. They said that they were just uh, loaded with books like the Articles of Limerick that had been published. And that wasn't, they didn't like that at all because there's some political ramifications to that. Oh, they were afraid of the, of the political uh innuendos and involved because that would then make people go, wait a minute, what, what, what was that? 
What's going on? How come we don't have that? Maybe we should look into that. And teachers across that, across Irish history, have been part of the people who said to you, look how you're having to put up with this. We need to understand. We need to rise up. We say, stop the oppression that's happening to us. And again, they were the ones who wanted the culture to pre- preserve, but teachers were oftentimes... And reading, you know, before people were reading, they didn't know anything, and reading gives you ideas. The greatest, the greatest thing in the world is to read so that your imagination can picture things. Well, the imagination can also call you to action, uh, whether it be good or bad, and they wanted people to know, and the English don't... We've, we've had book burnings in, in societies. Get rid of those books. You can't have that book. What's that book doing in the library? Well, it's a book and freedom of thought. And the English weren't particularly interested in the Irish having freedom of thought because it might shake up the authority, shake up the crown, and then disturb the, the, the culture or the society that they were trying to establish in Ireland, which was mostly of the ascendancy and those who uh, thought themselves better. Yes. There's another thing that they also said when they were teaching the people. And the, what do you want to teach those people for? They're just going to be tilling the ground and gr- growing some crops. They don't need to be knowing Latin, and they don't need to be, to, to be aware of writings and poetry. In other words, you're just like an animal. You, you, you don't have to think. You don't have to appreciate the more beautiful things of life from poetry and music. And, all, and the English weren't particularly interested in that. There was even under the system of fosterage under the Irish law, Brian law, I believe it was, there was something that was similar to that. Of course, it was more uh, a little more rational and friendly, I think. But they said that under the terms of fosterage, uh, if you took a child in, you were supposed to teach them certain things and it would be appropriate for what they were going to do with their life. Like a farmer would learn how to f- a farm, the girls would learn how to to sew and knit or whatever was common at the day, and that if you were found not to have been teaching the child the right thing, you could be fined two-thirds of the fosterage fee and uh, really uh, uh, lose the food and board that you put out over all those years. Sure, yeah, that, and there was the expectation that this is where you should, this is what you'll be able to accomplish in life, so there's no reason that you should be worrying about anything else. Just learn what your station is, and uh, let us worry about the more difficult things. And there's one term that we have got to get in here as we come to a close to this session here pretty soon, and that is the term, the poor scholar or stranger. And I found that really, uh, that's really a nice way to, to, ex- to explain it. Uh, with all these little schools going around, there were bound to be a few teachers that excelled and really excited people, and their fame would go from one end of the island to the other. And a student who had had all he could get from his local schoolmaster would pick up, throw, maybe throw his books in a satchel or a bundle over his shoulder and take off for this new head school. And when he got there, if he didn't have any money, he didn't have to pay usually. And he was put up sometimes for free. Maybe he had a part-time job, but he'd just show up. And it was a mark of honor for these teachers to have these traveling strangers, these traveling scholars, show up in their classes because it meant their fame and their work had brought them in, these students. And uh, it was really, even though it might not have brought them in money, it brought them in uh, other rewards and maybe other students. Well, and, you know, when you said the poor... um They also received great hospitality, that Irish hospitality, where if someone comes to my door, I I have to offer them something. And I've experienced that in Ireland in poorer regions. They would run to go get something from the the market or make something up that they wouldn't have for themselves, but because you're there, uh, we're going to give it to you uh, because we don't want to show ourselves as not being hospitable. And then, because they were honoring themselves in a way, because the scholar was coming, even though they might have been poor in one sense, they were so rich in other things. Yes, and I found one other uh, one other quote that I thought was pretty uh, pretty illustrative of what might happen between these teachers. You know, uh, somebody who had certain standards might be teaching in one area, and he had heard of... Uh, say, a group of teachers who might not have been very good, and they might have had maybe uh, uh, one too many sips in the winter to keep themselves warm. And so you find a a teacher sending off his prize student uh, with a pass, which was his letter. They'd say he'd send a pass. Well, that meant he had this letter of introduction, which would say, yes, he was a scholar, and 
please treat him right. So, it was also a recommendation, wasn't it? Yes, that yes, same pass, thing, recommendation yeah, yeah. and a pass. So he had free lodging. And one fellow said when he was traveling, he spent a whole summer traveling and learning, and nobody charged him a, a red cent that they saw. Of course, he said he made sure he put those books in his, his uh, little satchel over his shoulder, and they could see him sticking out and plunging through the thing there. They knew he was a, a scholar, and they wouldn't let him pay either for lodging or for food almost the whole year. Yes, yes. And, uh, uh, of course, he, he came back and spread the word to everybody, and he enjoyed it. But he also said, and I thought this was illustrative, he did not stay in the cities. He stayed outside of the cities and in the rural area because uh, that's where he was received uh, in oh, the best much way. better in the country. Yeah. Yes, yeah, yes. Much more so. Less suspicious, I suppose, in the country. Oh, that's And I think exactly they're, that right. way, they're that very same way today. And well, this, uh, this fellow that sent his prize student out, here's a quote from him in this letter of recommendation. We have it in writing. He says, Now do not let him be with Giddy Head O'Hackett, Coxcomb O'Boland, or buffoon Omo Kehi. Now that just told you he didn't want his prize student being fouled up by some folks who didn't have the right things in mind for a student. That's right. The the, the ones who carry on and and I love the I love the word you know the giddy head. I love that. Or, or the, obviously the ones who's always giggling, always carrying on. They're laughing at everything. Not or or they're saying they never take anything serious. They don't sit down and do their work the way they're supposed to be. Or the buffoon. And, you know, that, that, that's what, well, it's just a buffoon. He, the one who talks for the sake of talking. Uh, isn't that the truth? You know, uh, as we end this up, the f- uh, national schools on a national level for Ireland came about, uh, well, it was around 1830. And that really put the head school uh, uh, out of business, so to speak. The, the best of the teachers uh, presumably would have joined the uh, national school so they could get a regular salary didn't have to worry about it. The head schools did continue, and uh, some people say one or two of them survived into the 1890s, and sometimes it was out of necessity. A real rural area uh, may still not have had a school that was close enough to walk to, so they had a local fellow who had some smarts, and they had their children uh, uh, taught by him. And uh, Joyce, P.W. Joyce, he wrote The Social History of Ancient Ireland, so he had a lot of experience and he said that the head schools were gone with the coming of the famine in 1847. And uh, he himself had been educated in a head school at one time. And he described those teachers as rough, unpolished men who were brilliant scholars and teachers. And all of the students at that time, in the later days, he said were adults or grown boys. And they had already mastered reading, writing, and arithmetic. So they weren't dealing with the basics so much then. It was more advanced learning. And uh, he said that there were always a dozen or more poor scholars on hand in his day. So we see a uh, a migration and a, a, a difference in those head schools from the very beginning to the very end. It seems like the tradition was held on by some of the old folks who did have a love for learning. Uh, but I think that... Uh, that just about wraps it up for today. We could all always go on for more, and we'll we'll intersperse some things about the head schools and some of our uh, future shows on our, our different chapters. But uh, for today, this is Michael Laughlin saying uh, uh, the best of the head school to you, and Peter. And I'm saying to you, I'm sorry I didn't bring my turf. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> So ends this chapter of Irish History from the Hedgerow. The entire series is available at www.irishroots.com. We have broadcast series on genealogy, song, local history, as well as original publications for every county in Ireland. The Hedge School in Ireland was totally reliant upon the local community to survive, just as we are here today in our modern-day Hedge School. If you believe in what we are doing for your community, please do send us your support. You can sponsor a session of Irish Hedgerow History for as little as $100 and become a recognized scholar of the hedge. You will also receive a pass or letter of introduction from the instructors here at the school, as was the custom of the hedgerow. So keep the hedge growing with your donation, subscription, or membership. Thank you.
We have been available for speaking engagements, exhibits, tours, and educational events since 1984. You can reach us at the Irish Roots Cafe on Twitter and Facebook and on our homepage at www.irishroots.com. By mail at our U.S. location, the Irish Roots Cafe, Box 7575, Kansas City, Missouri, 64116. Leave a message on our phone recorder at 816-256-3360. Copyright 2009.